you can plot kind of power lines out there. And then Okay, great. So, good morning. Good morning, every, everyone. So, it's a pleasure to introduce Scott Morrison from Australian University. Australian National University, sorry. Uh, so he will give us a series of lectures on diagrammatic methods. Thank you. Thanks Scott. very much. Yeah, it's um, it's really great to be here. Bogota um, seems really uh, exciting so far, and uh, I'm really glad to uh, go to give these talks. Um, the, this, what I what I talk about the next couple of days, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll we'll have some overlap with what happened last week. Uh, and in particular, we'll see some of the same things that, um, that both Victor talked about and that Eric talked about, uh, but from a slightly different perspective. Uh, absolutely ask questions and interrupt me and derail the talks and go off, make me go off in different directions uh, if you'd like that. Um, and please also, I'd, I'd love to have some feedback from people about whether the overlap with last week is too much or too little and we can, uh, we can adapt uh, as needed. Okay. So let me uh, have a few minutes of just kind of rambling about what we're going to do at the beginning before we get into the, the meat of it. So this is, uh, oh, huh. because uh, I had trouble connecting my iPad, this isn't actually the most up-to-date version of the slides. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's only a few minor problems, so I think it'll be okay. I filled in this, this, this at the bottom. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, so we're, we're going to likely be talking about uh, pivotal categories or planar algebras. And we'll talk about why those are exactly the same thing, just with different formalizations of the, of the same underlying idea. Uh, so that means we'll be thinking about tensor categories from the point of view of generators and relations for tensor categories, and, uh, and what this can do for us. And for today, what I'm going to do is actually start with an example, an example that I think you talked about a little bit last week, the, the Fibonacci category. Uh, and we'll do it purely from a diagrammatic point of view, and we'll use that to motivate definitions of planar algebras and pivotal categories after we've done the example. It's important that examples come before definitions, not other things. Uh, then we'll talk quite a bit, we'll, we'll talk some more about uh, the temporary of Jones categories, which I understand Eric talked about. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about Mrs. Jones' mental item posts, so we can get to some of that quite, kind of quickly. And then some more examples of, uh, uh, of tensor categories that are, that are easy to describe via generators and relations. And then we'll make some contact between that example and uh, and the idea of algebra objects and module categories. And I'll show you how to think about algebra objects and module categories uh, entirely diagrammatically. And no algebra required uh, whatsoever. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully that will be interesting. And then we'll move on to some other topics maybe in the, well, we'll see where we get to by the, by the very end of the lectures. OK. So, uh, so Victor's talks uh, gave you what was presumably a very algebraic perspective. On, uh, on fusion categories. And he, he really started by telling you probably about monodal categories and associators, and he told you something about abelian categories and semi-simplicity. It was, it was all very familiar from, a, uh, from an algebraic point of view. Okay, so I want to do something different, but let's, um, let's motivate that, that different thing. So, uh, uh, so first of all, sort of Rep G uh, is, is really everyone's first example of a fusion category. Uh, and uh, I think it, the, the difference between Rep G and a general fusion category uh, is, well, uh, there's, there's this idea that it's a general fusion category is, is missing some of the features of Rep G, Rep G in particular is a symmetric variable category, a general fusion category isn't. So there's this idea that fusion categories are a, are a non commutative or quantum version of, of finite symmetry groups. But that's, a, that's again, an extremely algebraic perspective on why we should be interested in fusion. Does that, that make sense? Like the, the sort of a generalization of a very algebraic accurate. You take the axiomatization of that algebraic accurate and, and relax the, the, the structure. Okay, so Noah's talks this week, um, hopefully I'm not stealing any, any thunder at all, uh, is, is going to be telling us all about the Kerbordism hypothesis, which is this amazing correspondence between topological field theories and, and higher categories, and in particular in low dimensions between uh, two plus one dimensional local field theories and fusion categories. But the, 
the very general idea of the Kovodin hypothesis is that uh, topological field theories, which are which are local, can, can people read the writing here? Is it big enough? Um, so topological field theories, uh, which are local in some sense that no one will tell us about, uh, are entirely determined by their value at a point, and we can say that that value at a point is a is a is a higher category of some sort, and it's usually a higher category with lots of beautiful properties. For example, in low dimensions, we'll get fusion categories out of this sort of story. Uh, and this is a, a different perspective on why I care about higher categories and about fusion categories and so on. They're the, they're the things that tell us about topological field theories. And when you look at it that way, I think it, you can start to see the motivation for, for thinking about things uh, from a diagrammatic rather than algebraic perspective. So the, the essential idea of a, of a topological field theory is that it's some gadget that to every manifold in the appropriate dimension uh, assigns some collection of fields. That's the field in topological field theory. Those are the things that physicists would think of as describing the, the current physics on, on, that, on that bit of space. So it, for every manifold, it gives you some set of fields. Maybe it's a vector space, maybe it's some other structure. But it also gives you rules for gluing fields together. If I have a field on this manifold and a field on that manifold, and those manifolds can be glued together along some common piece of the boundary, Part of the data of the topological field theory is telling you how to assemble those local descriptions of fields into a field on the, on the big one. Okay. And the essential idea of the, the cobordism hypothesis is that uh, while a topological field theory describes how to associate fields to arbitrary manifolds, a higher category is only telling you how to associate fields to balls, just local pieces with, with boring topology. And the cobordism hypothesis is telling you that you didn't lose anything by passing to just knowing what the fields were on balls. Okay. So, so let's look at, at, at two examples of, of this. So one is that we might uh, take, this is, this is very schematic, don't worry if, if you don't know exactly what things mean in here, but we might have some topological field theory that associated some manifold, in fact this will work in, in any dimension, and it can just be some n-manifold, it will uh, associate to that the set of all principal g-bundles on that, on that manifold something you can do, and uh, you can imagine maybe the details of how gluing might work. We've got a principal G bundle on this manifold, and a principal G bundle on that manifold, and maybe some information which encodes how to clutch these bundles together along some, some uh, manifold that we're gluing on. You can get a principal G bundle on the big thing. And uh, this this topological field theory that, that really just works on every manifold at once, uh, has a corresponding uh, higher category, which is kind of the value at a point, and uh, that's essentially the, the, the category that controls the topological field theory is exactly that example Beck G, which, uh, which Victor, Victor talked quite a lot about. Uh, and to do this in an average dimension, you've got to work out how to understand Beck G as an n category. We're not going to bother going there, but in the two dimensional case, you know how to interpret Beck G as a tensor category, and a tensor category is just a special sort of G category. That's an example that, that you've seen some of. And this, this is called, this, this gadget is called dagger oh, We're not going to return to that example at all. It's just for the flavor of, I guess we're going to show you an example where the, where the fields on a manifold maybe look like something kind of geometrical that a physicist might recognize as being fields, okay? Okay, here's a completely different example. Uh, let's sort of work in two dimensions, and let's have our topological field theory associated to some surface torus with, with a puncture in it, so it's a circle from the boundary. And let's just associate to that, to an arbitrary surface, uh, formal linear combinations of unoriented trivalent graphs drawn on the surface. Okay. So if we just do it like that, that's going to be some infinite dimensional vector space for all these, all these, these graphs on the, on the surface. But let's maybe uh, quotient out by some local relation. For example, we might uh, have some relation. If there's any time you see uh, this little I-shaped diagram, uh, you can replace that with a, some linear combination, maybe with specified values of beta, beta, alpha, and beta, of these simple graphs where the, where the input is passed over. Okay. So that's now some huge infinite dimensional vector space, modulo applying this relation locally anywhere on one of those graphs. Uh, and well, a priori maybe it's not obvious this, whether this is infinite, whether this quotient is infinite dimensional or finite dimensional. Turns out 
that is finite dimensional. And so this gadget, this quotient, you can think of as a, as a topological field theory. And the rule for gluing is extremely simple. The rule for gluing just says, well, if you've got two pictures like this, uh, you're not allowed to glue, or for gluing is zero or something, if the points on the boundary don't match up. And if they do match up, you just glue the diagram. Okay, now this is an example uh, where when you run it through the Kerbordism hypothesis and ask what is the corresponding value at a point, which is going to be some two category, and in fact it will be some, some tensor category, and it will be this fusion category that fit, that, uh, that, that we've met some already, and we'll talk about more today. Okay, so these are just two examples of fields on a manifold, and the claim at least that there are, that there are, there are categories uh, which describe those topological field theories. Um, could you yes. just explain what you mean by fields from each of those examples? What, is, what do I mean by fields? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, the field is in quotes. Field doesn't mean right. anything. That's exactly right. the, the topological field theory, all it has to do is for every manifold, it has to give you some set, and you just call the elements of those sets fields. They don't, yeah. <laughs> fields is just a, just a label to make the physicists feel like they understand what we're doing. Um, <laughs> Or maybe vice versa. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah, make us pretend we know what the physicists are doing. Sorry, so what's yeah. an n category there? What is an n category? I mean, I, I, I kind of know what's an n category, but I don't know how big it is. Yeah. Um, well, it depends It depends a lot on what you think you know an n category is, mm -hmm. what sort of answer I can, I can give. Um, I mean, if. Uh, Okay, so an n category should have zero morphisms and one morphisms and two morphisms all over n morphisms. Let me not worry about all the lower dimensional morphisms. A big principle of what I'll say in the next couple of lectures is that lower dimensional morphisms never matter. Let me just describe what the top level morphisms look like. So the top level morphisms, the vec G as an n category, well, they should be, they should be, this is getting ahead of myself, but n morphisms should be things that you can draw in an n dimensional ball or an n dimensional box. Okay. And all it is is you pick a whole lot of hyperplanes, so n minus one dimensional surfaces, each labeled by a group element. And the surfaces can meet. And if, if three surfaces meet at some point, the group elements around, as you go around that, 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 uh, that seam along which they join, should multiply out to one in, in the group. Okay? So if you think about it in the two dimensional case, that description can really be thought of as actually just describing the morphisms in, in VEC G. Um, but it works in, in other we, maybe we can we can try and come back to that. Uh, okay. So, uh, well, okay. Maybe, maybe just here in these two examples, uh, these two examples look very different. Uh, one was sort of some geometric thing, and one was string diagrams uh, drawn on a manifold. But a very surprising thing uh, is that, that actually all local TFTs, or pretty much equivalently all higher categories, uh, can be described in that second way. That is, can be described via drawing diagrams on your manifolds. Now those diagrams might be very complicated, they might be labels on all of the strings and vertices or sheets if you're in higher dimensional stuff, and there may be lots of complicated local relations. But uh, we ought to, and there are various ways of making that, that precise, we ought to be able to describe any category in that way. And so this is, uh, this is sort of the point of what I'm going to do now, which is to describe things purely in terms of string diagrams and, uh, and uh, try and tell you what fusion categories and planar algebras and the middle categories are uh, in a purely diagrammatic form. Okay, so that bit was all just rambling at the beginning, sort of trying to tell you that why we should care about diagrams, and now let's uh, now let's go and do it. Okay, so we're going to do uh, we're going to do some very concrete calculations for a little while at the beginning. Uh, so let's suppose we have uh, some skein theory. So I don't want to define skein theory right now because in a moment we'll define pivotal categories and planar algebras, and those things will all be the same. All I mean now is that I want to think about diagrams drawn on on two-dimensional pieces of paper, or two-dimensional manifolds, maybe, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to think about linear relations between, between different diagrams. Okay. So, so we're going to have some scene theory. 
whatever that means, which just consists of planar oriented trivalent graphs. Okay? And let's let's write P sub n for the space of all planar trivalent graphs. Uh, this is something that got edited in my notes, so I can make it for this version. Uh, planar trivalent graphs with n boundary points. Okay? So just jumping ahead a little bit, these four diagrams here are diagrams in the space P sub 4. Okay? So planar, unoriented planar trivalent graphs with four boundary points. And uh, we'll allow formal linear combinations of these things because we're doing quantum stuff maybe. Uh, we have formal linear combinations of planar graphs. And it's a P sub n some, some vector space. And maybe maybe we've got some some uh, some linear relations. <coughs> So what we'd like to do is come up with some, some concrete examples of this setup. So let's try and let's try and do a little classification problem. Okay, we're going to go out and try and understand all of the skein theories based on an unoriented trivalent vertex uh, that satisfy some conditions. So what we're going to do is, is add these assumptions. So p zero, let's assume that the space of diagrams with no boundary points is just an empty diagram. Okay, so what do I mean there? Well, of course, there are lots of diagrams with no boundary points. Like, a, I could draw a tetrahedron flat in the plane. That's a trivalent graph, no boundary points. So what I mean here by this assumption is that we're assuming that we've got enough linear relations amongst graphs so that all of the closed diagrams can be rewritten using the relations down to the empty diagram. So that's what this assumption is saying. It's promising us that we've got enough relations out there to rewrite any diagram as a scalar multiple of the empty uh, just as a little notational convention here, uh, all of my diagrams will always be drawn in pink lines, and, but sometimes, rather, well, sometimes I'll draw the boundary of the region the diagram sits in, and I'll draw that with a green line. Okay, the green line is not really part of the diagram; it's just the, the boundary of the region in which the diagram is drawn, and I need to draw that sometimes just to be unambiguous about what this means. This is the empty diagram, mm. whereas this is the empty set. This is the set containing the empty diagram. And this is the empty set. Okay. Okay. So P zero is the empty diagram. Let's assume that P1 is actually the empty diagram, uh, is actually the, the empty, the zero vector space. So that's saying that we're assuming we have so many relations that every diagram, which is a single boundary point, can be rewritten to be equal to zero. Okay? Uh, every diagram with two boundary points can be rewritten to be some scalar multiple of just the, the really boring graph that exists in the screen. And every, every diagram with three boundary points can be rewritten using the relations to be a scalar multiple of just the trivalent. And, and here's what's going to make everything tick. Let's assume that uh, the, the space of diagrams with four boundary points has at most dimension T. But now the question is, can we, can we describe all possible instances of chain theory satisfying satisfying conditions? Okay. Well, how do we get started? Well, we look at this fact here, and we notice that in P4, we've got at least these four diagrams. We have many more, of course. You could uh, you know, like add bubbles in the middle here or add disconnected components of the graph. Like that. But we've at least got those four. And so since we've got those four diagrams in a vector space that's the most two dimensional, there must be a linear relation amongst them. Now, the first of the exercises for this afternoon, which is actually a little bit of a difficult one, you might not want to have this be the first exercise you try. What I want you to do is derive a contradiction of sense. Show me that something goes wrong. In the, in, the, in, the, in the exercises on the web page, I say, I give you a hint about what goes wrong. But one thing that could happen amongst these four diagrams is that there could just be a linear relation between the two of these guys. Okay? For example, this would equal that. But something goes horribly wrong in that case. And so, in the calculation I'm going to do now, let's just assume you've done the exercise, and we know that that's not true, and that there can't be a linear relation amongst these guys. So now we're in a fantastic situation. We've got this vector space is a dimension of those two. Uh, and so these guys, we must get a right of linear combinations of those. So let's proceed and see how, uh, what the consequences of that are. Okay. So we have to have a relation uh, like in the top line there. That I diagram has to equal well, some linear combination of the two diagrams from, uh, from Temple Lee. But uh, and let's now work out what we can say about those uh, those coefficients, alpha and beta, in such a relation. So if that relation holds locally, I can always add stuff on to the outside of that relation and produce new relations. So what I've done in the first line up here 
sort of, as I've just added a little arc at the top of each of those three diagrams, a little, a little cap connecting the two other points. And so I get alpha times uh, the string plus beta times the string the loop plus this lollipop uh, equals zero. And similarly, I can, uh, I could also take that first relation and add a cap on the side. Okay. This, this one is that diagram at the top of the screen connecting the two right next points. Similarly here and similarly here. And so I get this linear relation. And then for this one, what I've done is taken that diagram at the top and added a trivalent, put a trivalent vertex on the top of each of the three diagrams. Okay. Does everyone see what's happening there? Any questions about what's going on? Yeah. Uh, is there a reason why we don't want to have dimension density for the uh, Oh, I mean, just so that I get a tractable a, a tra a tractable classification problem. Uh, yeah, I mean, the at the moment you should think that we're just exploring. We're going out looking for examples of these things, and we're just throwing on some very strong conditions and seeing if we can we can answer what do these things look like. And so, yeah, I, I picked those numbers as an example of one of the conditions. Oh, I, I should say, actually, sorry. Um, because uh, um, I'm using these computer slides, um, if you would like to follow along, um, I think, did, are, they, are they already linked on the? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, okay, great. So on the summer school, there's a link to the, on the summer school webpage, there's a link already to these. So people can bring those up if they want to look back at them. Uh, and so, did you have a question? Yeah, are there any inclusive relationships between a diagram and a rotation of that same diagram or something like that? Yeah, so uh, we've been extremely informal and just said skein theory. And so, yes, uh, we, we don't want to think that these diagrams have a top and a bottom and a left and a right. They're just, they're just diagrams. So if you turn your head sideways, everything should still be true. We'll make all that formal in just a moment. Uh, okay, so what are we going to do with all of these relations we just we know from our hypothesis that the lollipop equals zero, because one of our assumptions, remember, was that the dimension of the space of diagrams with one boundary point was the zero vector space. That's in the zero vector space, that's so gotta be zero. Uh, and notice here, I'm uh, using, although somewhat inconsistently, uh, uh, Noah's great contribution to the field, <laughs> which is the, the undiscovery of the numeral zero. Uh, you have to be careful about adding zeros here, because it looks an awful lot like a like a loop of string, and I don't mean the loop of string there, I mean the, the, the number zero. So I try and write, write the word zero uh, rather than using the numeral. Okay, so the lollipop is zero, and in this diagram, the, the bygone, that's in the space P2 with two boundary points, and we assumed that that was just scalar multiples of the, of the single string, so that has to be B times a single string uh, for some of the B. So you did not use that convention immediately above. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was somewhat inconsistent. And, and I continue being inconsistent with that. Okay, but once we know those two facts, we can we can simplify lots of things here. Okay, so uh, oh, one thing I've left out is in this next line here, I've introduced one further thing. The the loop by itself is in the space P zero, which we assume the scalar multiples of just the empty diagram. So the loop by itself has to be equal to, to d some scalar times the empty diagram. That's what's going on here. When you say alpha plus beta d equals zero. We've taken this equation here, we've drawn out this diagram because it contains a lollipop, uh, we've replaced that circle with a D, and then we've used the fact that the string was the basis of that space of two di of diagrams with two boundary points. So the coefficients must vanish, so it's alpha plus beta D. Okay. And then we look at this equation, and we do basically the same analysis. We get alpha times D plus beta plus B has to equal zero. And we do almost the same thing in the third line, except here we're using the fact that the trivalent vertex is a basis for the space of diagrams with three boundary points. So we learned that alpha plus b has to equal zero. Okay. And this term goes away because there's a lollipop. So, is there a question there? Okay, so we learned all of these different uh, equations about our coefficients alpha root beta and the, the sort of structure parameters v. And it turns out that you can just solve those. Okay, those, those equations pretty much completely determine everything. Uh, let's leave v unspecified. But what we learn is that d has to be uh, the golden ratio or its scalar conjugate. 
uh, alpha hat to be minus b, beta has to be minus b times the, the gamma conjugate of whatever d was, so plus minus turns into a minus plus there, uh, which we can just rewrite as d over d. That's a bit weird, okay? I mean, we started off just with these hypotheses about the dimensions of the spaces of diagrams, and these concrete numbers are turning up, the golden ratio shows. Maybe that's, I don't know, I, I wanna argue that's a bit of a surprise, that, uh, that things like that happen. Um, but that's sort of the point of, like that's showing you that these sort of, this sort of idea of classifying small skein theories is viable, that you can really come down to quite concrete answers from just hypotheses about them. Okay. So we're gonna do a little trick at this point, uh, which is that uh, I can always go back in my skein theory and just redefine my trivalent vertex to be some scalar times the old trivalent vertex. And by using that trick, because I've got this freedom to rescale this vertex here, I can just tweak b to equal one, and that just makes life a little bit easier uh, in the formulas that follow. Uh, we can maybe think about that later or in the, in the, in the problem session. It's not as really obvious what's going on there. But yeah, let's just, uh, by using a, a, a sort of gauge freedom, set b equals one, and then plugging everything back into that formula up there, what we have is that uh, these two parallel strings is equal to this i shape diagram plus one over d times this tau cap, and d here, remember, is the golden ratio for its color. So we obtained a, a, a very explicit um, linear relation amongst our diagrams from our Okay, so you should actually at this point get really excited and think, wow, we're almost there. We, 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 we've almost solved this classification problem. Because that relation we just discovered is, looks like it's really powerful. It looks like it's a really effective relation. And suggests that maybe there's, a, there's at most one example satisfying the hypothesis we set up. Or maybe at most two, because we've got the, the scalar conjugate business. And the reason you should feel excited about this relation is that this relation all by itself is enough to take any closed diagram and rewrite it as a linear combination of the empty diagram. And as soon as you've got that, as soon as you have enough relations to rewrite things as scalable to the empty diagram, you're basically done. We're gonna make, we're gonna prove a theorem a little bit later that formalizes that. But for now, let's just see that we can do this. So in some closed diagram, anytime you have a trivalent vertex, it has to, well, yeah, it has to be connected to some other trivalent vertex, okay? So it's following one of the strings, it's got to end up somewhere. Well, I guess it could end up back in itself, but then you could just follow this one. It's got to hit some other trivalent vertex, okay? So every trivalent vertex is actually connected to another one. And we can just use our relation then to remove that pair, replacing it with some formal linear combination of other graphs, okay? So our single graph now becomes a linear combination, and we need to continue running this recursive algorithm on each of the terms that we produce by doing that replacement. But each of those terms we produced by doing this replacement had fewer trivalent vertices in it, so you can just keep running this argument until we get a big linear combination of diagrams with no trivalent vertices in them. And all of those could be, since they're planar diagrams, are a whole collection of circles, maybe disjoint or nested circles, and we can use the fact that we know the value of the loop is d, the, the golden ratio, to evaluate all of those. So let's just run this as an example. Here's a tetrahedron. I'll apply this relation in the highlighted region and I get this minus one over d times this. And in each of these diagrams, I'll apply the relation again, either here or, or here, and I get, uh, well, you can, uh, you can follow that calculation if you like, and you get at the end, what do you get at the end? Uh, minus d plus d inverse, you can cancel everything out, which uh, using the value of d actually turns out to be the number one. Okay. So you can see, hopefully you can see that this would have worked on any planar trivalent graph. You could have, uh, you could have calculated the values there. Is everyone happy with that calculation? Okay. So, uh, such a skein theory, uh, that is one where the, where the dimension of the, of the zero box space is at most one, Right? Saying the dimension of the zero box space is at most one is another way of saying every diagram is a scalar multiple of the empty diagram. Possibly, the reason I said most one is maybe everything is actually zero, we do have to worry about. Uh, so such a scheme theory is called evaluable. And in a moment when we make the connection with scheme theories and, 
and pivotal categories. This will be just the fact that the, the tips that you did develop corresponding pivotal category symbol. So we'll come back to that. And we have this very useful fact that if you have an ideal in an invaluable scene theory, then that ideal is contained in what's called the negligible ideal. So I need to define a few words here for that to make any sense. So first of all, uh, can someone tell me the definition, make up, uh, we need to make up a definition of what an ideal in a scheme theory is. I want someone, 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 someone to tell me. Some blue diagrams with chain of diagrams. Sorry? Can you do a diagram with chain of diagrams? Well, hmm. Can we, let's, let's try and be a bit more precise. I so, said I have diagrams so that whenever you do a diagram with a set that is inside I, you obtain a diagram that's inside I. Yeah, okay. So, so the, maybe the way I'd slightly tweak that is, right. first of all, the, 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 the ideal isn't going to be a set of diagrams. It's going to be a set of formal linear combinations of diagrams. Okay. Um, and yeah, so you should think if you wanted to, um, and that, that set, it's not, maybe it's not necessarily a single set, like for each of the P sub n's, the diagrams are then boundary points. It's some subspace of, of those diagrams and then boundary points. And then, yeah, with the rule, if you've got some, some, some linear combination of diagrams in the ideal, and we glue anything else onto the outside around the edge, the resulting linear combination is absolutely fine. Great. Okay. So the negligible, the, the negligible ideal consists of all of the negligible diagrams, or formal linear combinations of diagrams. And then something is negligible. If everywhere you can build a closed diagram by adding more stuff on the outside, you always get zero. Uh, it's pretty easy to see that those things form an ideal. Okay? Every way of adding stuff on, so you get something closed, gives you zero. If you add a little bit more on, then you're part way to adding enough on to make it closed. So you form an ideal. Uh, okay, so here's the proof of this, this general fact. Uh, suppose we've got some, some ideal, and we've got something in the ideal, but suppose that f is non-negligible, okay? Being non-negligible exactly means there's some way of closing it up so that uh, we get something, we get some non-zero scale and multiple of the, of the empty diagrams. That means there is some diagram g. So that when we glue f to g, forming a closed diagram, we get something that's a non-zero scale and multiple of the empty diagrams. Okay, but since f was in the ideal, this whole thing is in the ideal, so that non-zero scalar multiple of the, of the empty diagram is in the ideal. So the empty diagram is in the ideal. Okay? But now I can take any diagram and glue on the empty diagram next to it. And so that just shows that every diagram was in the ideal. Okay? Yes. And so that tells us that if you have something non-negligible that's in the ideal, then the ideal is actually just I guess I probably should. I should have said. Uh, I shouldn't have said every ideal. Because obviously, you've got a boring ideal consisting of everything. But every non-trivial ideal is contained in the negative. Okay. Are people? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, what that tells us is that. Once we've discovered enough relations that let us prove evaluability, that that is suffice to, to evaluate all closed diagrams, what we should do is just go and form the free scheme theory, whatever exactly that means, uh, with precisely those relations that suffice to evaluate it. So in this example, that is, the Q be the thing that's generated by a turbulent vertex and has these two relations. Those are exactly the two relations that we use to, to evaluate it. And we just argued that this thing is evaluable. Yeah, that was how we picked it. And, and there's a functor, whatever exactly functor means here, uh, from the Q scheme theory, that is our free one, to P, our hypothetical one with the known dimension bounds. Okay? And all that's saying is that you can take a diagram in Q and interpret a diagram in P. And this makes sense because we already proved that those two relations hold over in P. Okay? So this is well defined. Okay? Just map out of the P. Um, and later we'll see how to really say, say that as a, as a functor. Uh, but it's easy to see that sort of every diagram in P came from some diagram in Q. Okay? 
And so to describe what P is, all that we need to do is, uh, is describe the kernel of this map. Okay? That is those diagrams here that are sent to zero here. And obviously enough that the kernel is an ideal in this sense. So we just need to understand what the ideals of, of Q are. But we've proved that Q is, uh, is evaluable. So all of the ideals are contained in the negligible ideal. So deciding exactly what P is, is just a matter of deciding which sub-ideal of the negligible ideal uh, could, we, could we kill when we went from this, this presented thing to our, our, hypothetical, our hypothetical P. OK, so well, uh, if we add on one more assumption about P, that P is non-degenerate, so I didn't say this in the slide, but non-degenerate uh, it just, uh, just means that the negligible ideal is zero, okay? There are no, no negligible morphisms. Uh, then there's, if, if, we, if we wanted to only classify such P's that are non-degenerate, there's only one possible answer at this point. You have to have killed the entire negligible ideal, that is the kernel of our functor from Q to P must have been the entire negligible ideal, because if you didn't kill everything that was in the negligible ideal, it would still be negligible over in, in P, and then it couldn't be non-degenerate. Okay, so you can see now how, what the idea was is that, that if we had enough relations to evaluate everything, and we had the assumption that things are non-degenerate, then we just prove that there's a unique category. There's a unique, a unique possible scheme theory. Because it has to be the free thing, modulo the relations that suffice to evaluate, modulo whatever it's negative for ideal. Now, we may not be super satisfied with that answer to our classification problem, because we might not at this point have a really explicit description of what the negligible ideal really is, but we at least prove the uniqueness result. Uh, okay. In this case, actually, you can see that the negligible ideal in this freely presented thing, uh, Q, was not actually zero. And let's do a little calculation to see that. Let's see if you look at the lollipop attack to a uh, one more vertex and apply the relation on, on, that, on that arc, you just get this. And that's zero, because the one over here cancels here. And it's easy to see that, of course, in any closed diagram, any time you have a lollipop, the lollipop is attached to something. So you see this. And so that tells you that the lollipop is in the negligible ideal. Because in any, in any closed diagram, the lollipop will make everything zero. Uh, and in fact, you can, you can show that that generates the negligible ideal. But we're not, we're not ready to prove that. Sorry. Yeah. Is the negligible ideal the kernel of it? Uh, ooh, um, I mean, in this example, yes, but I mean, I think in general, no, I don't know that you can say this. Okay, so, okay, so we, we were sort of happy. We said that whatever our category had to be, whatever our, whatever our scheme theory P was, it had to be this free thing more than the negative ideal. But that's a, that's, there's, a, there's a big possible problem, which is that the, the free thing that we wrote down by generators and relations might have just been zero. Okay? We wrote down some relations, but they might have been inconsistent in the sense that I, there, there might exist out there some, some closed diagram, maybe even just a tetrahedron that I could have evaluated in two different ways. Maybe a tetrahedron is a bad example because there's not many ways to evaluate it. Maybe two tetrahedra joined by a dumbbell. Uh, and maybe I could have imagined that there were two different sequences of ways of using the relation. Maybe I could have deleted that edge first or maybe deleted this edge first. And I could have just obtained two different scalars by applying the algorithm in two different ways. But then if I obtained this was equal to two different scalars times the empty diagram, that tells you the empty diagram is zero. Uh, and, uh, and then once the empty diagram is zero, the whole thing collapses. So at the moment, we've got nothing that guarantees that our freely presented thing wasn't just, the, just all zero. And this, in general, is a, is a hard problem. Uh, and and uh, there are a couple of solutions. Uh, so one is that actually sometimes you can directly, via, via scheme theoretic arguments, prove that your, your evaluation algorithm, your rule that turns a diagram into a scalar multiple empty diagram, is well-defined. 
for example, you might just argue like, oh, if I if I reduce here first or I reduce here first, then I get the same answers because at later steps I can do other things that that cause the calculations to converge again as I as I reduce. That's a kind of confluence idea. Um, but in general, that turns out to be extremely difficult. And uh, I was very disappointed while writing these slides that I couldn't make that argument work for this example. And uh, Noah said he couldn't make it work either. And it's sort of a, just a sign that this is, while it's tempting to wish that you could do things purely diagrammatically at this point, it's, uh, it's a bit of a mirage. It's, it's, it's hard to do. But one example we'll talk about later in the lecture is you can do this. And maybe I'll show you, show you something about that. OK, but another answer is that you can just go and find Q or some non-zero quotient of it uh, elsewhere in mathematics. And this is typically what you end up having to do at this point. You've got some scene theory. You've got it completely pinned down in the sense that you have enough relations to say everything about it. You just can't prove it's non-zero, and you just go looking for it. And so this one, well, it turns out you're in, you're in luck. You can make it lots of different ways. This thing is the is the Fibonacci category, so it's uh, you can take lots of different quantum groups of roots of unity and semi-simplify and get this thing, or you can build it directly by a simple V, or you can build it by thinking about a chromatic polynomial. But you've got to go out and do something else to, to, to do that. Uh, but there is another approach, um, which are um, which is a very general purpose construction, where you've got some scheme theory, you know something about the the the, the, the scheme relations, you, you have it. There are some general purpose constructions to prove these things are not zero, and we'll eventually get back to those. Um, these are these are this, this tricky thing using these ideas of graph planar algebras, or uh, when we get there, maybe I'll say something about the, the category theoretic interpretation of that approach. There is a general purpose machine to, to do this, but it involves it involves some work. And so very often we hope that V works, and the thing we're looking at, we can find that's work. Sorry, that's a bit unsatisfactory. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to. Obviously, I'm not going to go and talk about quantum groups in detail now. Uh, later, we might come back and, and see how we can see this interpolate. Okay, so okay, so at this point I want to um, leave this example for a little while, so you can actually for now just you can pretend the talk starts again here if things are confusing uh, or boring. Now's the time to wake up again because we'll, we'll we'll start over at a slightly different place, and uh, the point is to um, to make formal definitions <coughs> that uh, make sense of a lot of what we said uh, in these sort of calculations. So the the we'll we'll start by giving a a definition of a of a planar algebra. Um, just so I have a sense of how quickly or slowly I should go here, could I just get a show of hands of like who's seen the definition of a planar algebra before? Excellent. Okay. Um, uh, for those people who put their hands up, sorry because I'm going to tell say all the details. Good luck in the room. Okay. So. Um, a, a planar algebra uh, consists of uh, two pieces of data. So first of all, a collection of vector spaces, p sub n, for each natural number n. And for each spaghetti and meatballs diagram, so here's the, here's the plate on the outside, here are my meatballs on the inside, and the spaghetti. Uh, and maybe I should have um, made this a little bit more general. This, we can have closed loops of spaghetti uh, if, we, if we like. I know it's a bit hard to make it home, but uh, we can do. Um, okay, so for each such spaghetti and meatballs diagram, we're meant to have some linear map. And what is that linear map? Well, we're meant to look at all of the meatballs, the inner circles, so here there's four, here there's three, here there's four, and the linear map goes from the tensor product of those spaces associated with inner circles to the vector space associated with the outer circle. This outer circle here had five boundary points. So we're mapping between them. Okay. So we've got a linear map between those tensor points. And let's see. I've, um, I've, numbered the, I've numbered the meatballs, so you know which uh, tensor factor corresponds to, to which meatball. And I've also put these little marked points labeled by stars somewhere at the edge of each meatball because we bought them in the moment. It means that we know kind of the uh, we can we can tell the difference between a meatball and a rotated version of a meatball. So there's a mark for each one. Uh, okay. Um, 
Do you guys have a question? Or? I was saying, uh, I couldn't follow the, how you associate the T4 to the number. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so, we, so the first tensor factor, we look at the first circle. Okay. We count how many strings hit that circle. Okay. And so in this case, we see there are four strings. Okay. And so the vector space P4 is the vector space of stuff with four boundary points. So associated to this circle is the vector space P4. The second circle has three strings coming into it, so we associate to that circle P sub three. So for each circle, we just look at how many strings here and use the corresponding vector space. Yeah, and P5, there were five boundary points on the outside circle. So the map from the tensor product of the inner circles to the, the vector space associated to the outer circle. Okay, so that's the data of a planar algebra, and then it has to satisfy some axioms. And the axioms are, uh, there are, there are three axioms. So the, the first axiom is that you can glue diagrams inside of each other. Okay? So here what I've done, uh, so first of all, on the inside here, there's some spaghetti and meatballs picture with, uh, uh, with two inner circles. Okay? So if I deleted that for a moment, and just left that, that, that part blank, on the outside, I'd see some different spaghetti and meatballs picture, also with two inner circles. So what I can do is I can take this diagram and plug it into the hole, plug it into one of the holes of the other diagram. And so then if I erase that green line where I plug things in, at the end of the day I've got some spaghetti and meatballs picture with three input circles. Okay? After erasing the green line, there are just three input circles. And so the planar algebra associates that glued together diagram, some multilinear map from this into this into this to the outside circle. But it also associated something to this diagram. Uh, I should have drawn a much I should have drawn a better example. Uh, it's easy to see. This this diagram here is the is the outer one, and this diagram here is the inner one. Okay. So I've got a, a linear map to the outer guy, and I've got a linear map to the inner one. And of course, I can compose those linear maps. Okay. This is this linear map is something that takes an input to here and an input to here. So what I can do is I can uh, I can if I've got my three inputs to here, here, and here, I can shove the first two of them into here and get something for that vector space and do nothing with the third one. And then I can take the answer I got out of this diagram and shove it into here and shove in the, the, the vector and the vector space for the third circle in there. Okay. And we should get the same answer out of it. So I can either compose spaghetti and meatballs diagrams or I can compose the linear maps and I should get the same answer. If I had something to glue in there as well, yeah, then I could have I could have put that over here in this spot. I mean, you can, um, yeah. It sort of doesn't matter whether you specify this axiom by saying glue something into every inner circle or just glue things into one. So it's pretty easy to see the axioms that whatever way you say. Any other questions about what that one means? Yeah. So is it the definition of what no, not a definition. No, no, no. Because remember, the data on the previous page already said we've got something for this guy. And it said we've got something for this guy and we've got something for this guy. This really is an axiom that's saying that those, those had to coincide. That there were this huge family of constraints between the choices we made because of the linear maps and the previous thing. It's not a definition. Because once I've erased the, this, this sort of intermediate green circle and it together, this is just one of our spaghetti meatballs diagrams to the same thing. And you should think of this as being like um, exactly like associativity of an algebra. Okay, it really is literally. Yeah, yeah. You can you can go back to the previous page and just take the collection of all spaghetti and meatballs diagrams and never talk about vector spaces. They form an operator on the gluing them inside each other, and this gadget is an algebra from it. For, for an okay, there's this axiom. There's another axiom that says you have a radial diagram with two concentric circles. And the strings are all just radial arcs, and the the, the mark points match up. Okay, then that has to act by the identity. If uh, if I took a radial diagram but with a twist, so that the mark points were not in the same region, then there's no axiom that says that it has to act by the identity. The, the twists can act in interesting ways, and that's that wasn't important. <coughs> um, maybe in, in this axiom I neglected to say something about the mark points when I glue some smaller diagram into the hole of one of the bigger diagrams, I have to do that in a way so the match points match up. I can't glue them into the match points, so I'm so 
Okay, then the final axiom, which actually contains a lot of content and maybe is a little bit scary, uh, is that if I have two different diagrams, let's they say they've got the same collection of inner circles, and the same inner circles are in the same places, uh, then if those two diagrams are isotopic, that is, if all that I'm doing is moving the spaghetti around in the region between the, the move balls, uh, then the linear maps associated with those two things have to be equal. Ah, well, so, yeah, so remember the associated with the radial diagram here, we get a linear map from P6 to P6. And I'm just asking that linear map is again mathematics. Yeah, so I, I can always think of these diagrams as acting on, if I have a collection of vectors living in the vector space of the inner circles, I can think of it as acting on the vector that goes in here and gives me a vector in the vector space associated with X. Okay, so those are three axioms. How the, how the linear maps have to, have to be. And it, it's already kind of got an entirely algebraic definition because there's something about the topology of strings in the plane hiding in this axiom. Mm -hmm. It's a little complicated also. Okay, so let's have an example. Uh, so uh, I think Eric already talked a fair bit about, uh, about Kevin Lee Jones. Uh, and, and he talked about it as presumably as a monoidal category, but we want to talk about it today as a as a as a planar algebra. So I'm just going to say uh, the the nth vector space is just formal linear combinations of all of these templated of Jones diagrams that have any boundary points. You quotient out by some relation that says every time you see a circle, a closed circle of spaghetti, that's equal to zero. Uh, that's not equal to zero. That's equal to delta. Uh, which is some complex number that we pick. There's a whole family of these depending on the values of delta. And uh, a useful way you can think about these is that these diagrams are the, are the vegetarian spaghetti and meatballs diagram. So the ones with no inner meatballs. It's just a spaghetti. Okay? And that makes it pretty easy to see what the what the action of, of spaghetti and meatball diagrams is. Okay? If I've got some big spaghetti and meatballs diagram, it's got a bunch of meatballs, I can just I'm actually a vegetarian, so this is something that I occasionally <laughs> you have to do. You can you can take out the meatballs, and instead of eating the meatballs, put in your smaller plate of spaghetti. And of course, now you've got a big plate just of spaghetti. Okay, so we ended up with a, with a vector back in this vector space. Okay. Uh, no, 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 sorry. I should have put this this circle in pink. This is a piece of spaghetti, not a meatball. Well, uh, so, so well, the definition of the vector space, TLJ sub n, is the, is the collection of diagrams that don't have any meatballs. By definition, the vector space is the diagram with no meatballs. It's just spaghetti. Okay? So these diagrams that go in my plate. Okay? So there's no spaghetti. Okay? So all of these were pink strings here, spaghetti strings, no meatballs inside. And so what I'm saying is that if, now I need to tell you how a spaghetti and meatballs diagram acts on a collection of spaghetti diagrams, and that is you put your small plates of spaghetti inside each of the meatballs, and you can see then that it's, that it's all spaghetti after that. Now, we'll, we'll, yeah, there's a whole lot of exercises here actually about planar algebra, so we'll have time to think about what the definition is really saying in the afternoon. Um, okay, so what I want you to do in this exercise is sort of play with this definition a little bit. Um, so one thing is maybe Tell me what a morphism of planar algebras ought to be. Okay. If you know about operad, it's obvious. But you can work at it anyway. It probably should be, if I've got P and Q, it probably should consist of a linear map from each PN to each QN, and then it should, those linear maps should satisfy some boundary points. Okay. So uh, a very important fact is that if you have any planar algebra P, as long as you know that, oh, no, you don't need to say that at all. Yeah, so this is this is rubbish. For any planar algebra P whatsoever, um, there's a morphism. After you define what a morphism is, yeah, you, you put in this assumption because you wanted the circle to have a value. Oh, it's thank you. Too great. strong of an great. assumption. Great, great, great. You still want the circle. Okay, to have okay, a value. yeah. Let's, thank you. Okay, yes. Okay, let's keep that. So, no, I just did the exercise for you. Um, uh, yeah. So there's, there's a universal fact that there's always a map from T or J to any planar algebra. As long as there's some sort of smallness condition about that planar algebra. 
this exercise is just asking you to describe these vector spaces up there. Tell me what the dimension of T L J sub n is. Uh, I think actually Eric did this for you, so you can look, do some revision uh, to answer that exercise. And then I want you to remember that this definition is is uh, is a toy for you to play with. It's not set in stone. You're allowed to tweak it to make modifications to the definition to handle other cases. So examples, what if I wanted to work in a world where I have oriented spaghetti? All the pieces of spaghetti have, have arrows on them. What should the definition of a planar algebra be now? It's actually going to be a much bigger collection of vector spaces. It won't just be one tree natural number. Write down the details. Maybe I want to do things where the regions in between the spaghetti come in different colors. Maybe I want to define a Colombian planar algebra where there are like three different colors in the regions. So I can axiomatize that. There are, there are lots of variations you can make. And as we go on, we'll, we'll eventually maybe use some generalizations. Uh, but I just want to make sure, yeah, at least write down the details of how to do the oriented version, just to be confident that you're allowed to change the definition yourself. It's not, yeah, this isn't, this isn't the only one. This is just the very simplest way of, this is the very simplest type of planar algebra. OK, um, let's, uh, let's, um, Turn now to a different perspective on uh, on string diagrams and how we how we should axiomatize string diagrams. Oh, actually, sorry. Maybe let me just go back and just make it slightly more explicit. Um, uh, why this is axiomatizing string diagrams? Uh, I mean, you should think here that this collection of vector spaces P n. You should think of the elements of P sub n maybe as the labels that you can put on the, so the elements of P sub 4, the labels that you can put on a four-valent vertex in some string diagram. And then the fact that you can glue together these labels, these, these labeled vertices using, these dia using spaghetti meatball diagrams is telling you how to assemble string diagrams out of, out of, out of them. Uh, maybe that wasn't super clear. That's meant to be one way of asking. Okay, so let's let's think about another way of axiomatizing things. Um, I didn't actually look this up in Eric or Richter's notes. Did they talk about um, pivotal structures on monoidal categories? Yes. yes. Okay. How? Uh, good. Okay. T tell me if I if I if I say things that are, uh, have been said at some point. Okay. We'll get to pivotal categories in just a second. Okay. So we're gonna. Sort of do a few steps here of going up from monoidal categories to rigid monoidal categories to pivotal monoidal categories and talk about the string diagrams uh, at, each, at each step. So let's make a definition. Let's fix C some monoidal category and let's make it a, a strict monoidal category. So what, what does strict mean? Yeah, yeah, the associator is just the identity on the node. You don't need to worry about parentheses when we answer that. Okay. So let's say it's a, we start with a strict monoidal category. Okay, so a monoidal string diagram for some fixed strict monoidal category C is some planar diagram consisting of oriented strings which always point up the page. Okay. There's, a, there's an optimistic and a pessimistic convention here. And this is the optimistic one. Uh, and as well as the oriented strings, you have uh, well, you can call them vertices or boxes or coupons, and you see those words in different parts of the literature. Uh, where uh, I'm, I'm going to typically draw them as vertices, although sometimes I draw them as little boxes. And those vertices have some strings that enter it from below, and some strings that exit above. And uh, and those vertices should be labeled by appropriate morphisms from the Monroe category. Okay. So here G has strings coming in labeled by W and C, and has strings going out labeled by Y and Z, and so G, G should be labeled by a morphism from W to C to Y to Z. Is okay. it like that prop? Uh, sorry. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah. I, 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 I don't like props, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, uh, one thing to say, you, you can see why I asked that things are strict at this point, because it's just so that when there are many strings coming into the bottom of a vertex, I didn't 
you can specify how accurate the size of the size of them. Okay, so uh, if you give me some formula for a morphism in C that's built out of smaller morphisms by composition and tensor product, we can construct a string diagram corresponding to that formula. Okay, we can just represent any composition by stacking things vertically, and we can represent tensor products by horizontal juxtaposition, is the traditional word. So here, uh, we can represent uh, G followed by F. I've decided to, to, to mutiny and uh, not use the rest of the world's conventions about how you compose morphisms or functions because it's stupid. And uh, obviously, you should do the first morphism first and the second morphism second. And so, uh, because I've decided to mutiny, I decided I'd better use a different symbol so that you don't get confused. That symbol there is probably too small for you to read, but that's, that's meant to be G and two little arrows. And that's, that's my notation for composition from now on, okay? You should all start using it too, because it's awesome. This is use the, follow the morphism G and then follow the morphism F, okay? It's the opposite of the usual function composition symbol. Fine. Um, okay, so this, this is a diagram that we could use to represent G followed by F, and this is a diagram we could use to represent F tensed with, with G. Okay, and so the the great theorem that tells you why you should care about monoidal string diagrams is that uh, as soon as you have two monoidal string diagrams which are isotopic, then the corresponding morphisms that they represent in the monoidal category are automatically equal. Okay? Now, if we look at careful in this theorem, the isotopy uh, can't just be some arbitrary isotopy in the plane. It has to be an isotopic that passes through all that's always through monoidal string diagrams, so the strings always have to point up the page never with any critical points appearing or disappearing during that. And also during the isotopy, we can't rotate vertices. We can slide them around, but only, uh, only rigidly. Uh, okay. That's a lovely theorem um, that uh, I won't attempt to, to prove, uh, but here's a great exercise. So this theorem immediately tells you that these two, mor these two morphisms in any monoidal category are equal, okay? And the, the exercise to see the value of this theorem is I want you to tell me a number which was exactly how many axioms from the axioms from a nodal category that Eric or Victor probably told you last week, exactly how many applications of an axiom do we use to check that this equation holds in any monoidal category? Um, I think you could, there's a, you can argue between, there are, there are two different numbers that I, I would accept as the right answer. You can argue between n and n plus one for a certain value of n. I want to know what that ends. Um, yeah. Do you recognize a tensor G from G tensor F? Uh, left, left to right. You, as, as you read the tensor product symbol, the word of tensor product left to right, you read the diagram. Left well, I mean, if I just see the diagram, how do I know that that is the diagram of the tensor G or G tensor F? You mean, if you see this diagram? No, if I see only the one on the left. Well, it's labeled by F. The symbol F oh, okay, so the label is always there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the vertices are, sorry. Uh, the, the strings in these diagrams are always labeled by objects of the category, and the vertices are always labeled by morphisms between the tensor product of the incoming strings and the tensor product of the outgoing strings. Yeah, the labels are absolutely part of the part of the Okay, that wasn't very exciting. Let's, let's go on a bit. Um, oh, do I really want to say that? Uh, Should have, I should have put labels everywhere. Okay. Um, okay, let's do this. Okay. I'm going to define all in one breath a monoidal string diagram category. Okay, this is this is, this is one phrase, one atomic phrase that we're defining in one go here, and uh, it's going to be a notion that will be equivalent to the notion of a monoidal category, okay? But I'm, I'm telling you some new definition just now. Uh, and the, the reason I wanted to do this is because uh, actually I could define for you uh, n categories based on string diagrams in basically only as many words, which is kind of amazing because usually n categories are hard to define. 
but this definition is easy to get over. Okay, so what does a monoidal string diagram category consist of? It consists of um, three pieces of data. The first two pieces of data are, are sort of labels telling you how you're allowed to label your string diagram. So it's a set L of edge labels. And then, for each pair of words, W in and W out, those are words drawn from this alphabet uh, L, that would have a new set, uh, the labels from W in to W out. Okay? And I'm thinking of those that L, the elements of L, are the things that I might see drawn on an edge. And then the elements of, uh, of L from in to out are the things that I might see drawn on a vertex. Okay? With that word right across the bottom and that word right with w, with w in right across the bottom and W out right across the bottom. Okay. So we've got two sets, um, my label sets, and then the, the, the third and last piece of data in defining one of these gadgets is that for each pair of words W in and W out, I can look at the collection of all monoidal string diagrams which have W in at the bottom and W out at the top and have all of their strings labeled by these label sets. So, so I might, I mean, so this is saying I'm allowed to have complicated diagrams Oops, I've got to make sure it's monoidal everywhere since things can move upwards. Okay. So I have this huge vector space of all string diagrams filled out of my label sets. And I just want to specify some subspace of those string diagrams. Okay? And so these three bits here are going to be the, the entire, all of the data of a monoidal string diagram category. And then there are two axioms. So one axiom is that this collection of subspaces U forms an ideal under stacking or, or horizontal juxtaposition. And the second axiom is that if I've got two string diagrams and they just differed by a monoidal isotopy, then the difference of those two string diagrams is in this specified ideal. Okay. So what does that have to do with normal monoidal categories? Well, uh, from that data, you can build a monoidal category. What is the sort of, let's call that honest monoidal category C hat. And the definition of C hat is what objects are just the, the, the basic label set L. And the morphisms in C hat from uh, one, oh, uh, maybe I should have actually written, sorry, I should have written here that the, the objects in C hat are the words in L rather than L itself, so words in L. And then the morphisms in C hat from some word in L to another word in L is well. You can take all string diagrams from the incoming word to the outgoing word and quotient out by whatever the specified subspace was. Okay? And it's easy to check that that really does define a monoidal category. The fact that the ideal U was closed under horizontal juxtaposition and vertical stacking gives you all the axioms of the monoidal category. And the theorem is that every monoidal category is actually equivalent, monoidal equivalent, to one we built in that way, okay? And the sketch of that is really easy. You just uh, take your label set to be all of the objects of the category you started with. You take your label set um, for, uh, for the vertices with some incoming word and some outgoing word. If you just take the homes in the original, in the original category, well, x and y here are all words in objects, so maybe you actually like really Take that word and tensor it all together to form a single object you see again. So just that's effectively just saying that our string diagrams here are just labeled, the strings are labeled by arbitrary objects and the vertices are labeled by arbitrary morphisms. Okay? So we sort of did something pretty tautological here. But now a very important thing is that you know, I've got a string diagram where everything's labeled by the data from a monoidal category. There's an evaluation map. You can take that whole string diagram and read it as a single morphism. You've got some evaluation map that takes a string diagram to a single morphism, and it will just define this ideal view to be the kernel of the evaluation map. I don't want to spend too long on this because these two slides are not really necessary for everything else I do do. But uh, one then just has a few little checks to see that the category you get, that well, you have to check that this really was a string diagram of the category, in the sense of the previous page, and then when you apply this construction, you get something when you're equivalent to the start. Okay. So this is. The sketch of the proof. That, uh, I, don't, I don't think I can read all this. 
Uh, remember that, so here when I said the objects of words in L, when I, because I, I made a mistake, I should have said the objects of C are words in L, take the empty word. Is a what? Is contracting an edge to a point? No, that's not of an underlying point. The ideal has to contain differences f minus g whenever f and g are isotopic, but it usually contains much more than that. For example, here, uh, if uh, if I had um, if I had the example you're thinking about, I have some string diagram here where I've composed f and then g. Okay. The difference between that and this guy, labeled by f composed with g, okay, that difference will be in the kernel of the evaluation map because they both evaluate the same thing in the ambient category. And so, the, the operation you're asking about mm -hmm. will be in the ideal when you make this definition of the ideal. But in general, it's it's just some idea. Okay. What one for you? Step is maybe to replace the category for a skip one because I am assuming that you. Well, you think uh, I mean, of course, every monodal category is monodal yeah. equivalent to a strict one, so the theorem mm -hmm. still works. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. To do this construction, yeah, you should strip it. You can, I mean, the question of how do you how do you prove that monodal categories are all monoidally equivalent to strict ones? You can prove that using string diagrams as well. So you can bake that into this argument. I mean, when I said uh, when I made this definition, if I just said left parenthesized the word, this this construction I think still works. Yes. Ah. Uh, That's a. Good question. Let me not try and answer it on the spot. Um, uh, I, I really like linear categories, um, so yeah. But uh, no, but I also like things enriched in other things as well. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So sorry. Let's let's. If you if you didn't like what the, happened on the previous two slides, uh, that's okay. You can start paying attention again. Um, we're now going to. We talked about monoidal string diagrams. And now we're going to talk about rigid monoidal string diagrams. So we call the definition of a monoidal category being rigid. So that is, uh, for every object x, there's a dual object that I'll write as x check. And there are maps, evaluation, and co-evaluation. Um, and it's, of course, just a convention whether in the evaluation map it's x then x check or x check then x. Uh, I probably chose arbitrarily at the moment of summarizing the slides. Uh, but it's important when you really have a rigid category that you only have it one way. Uh, there's a co-evaluation there that goes from the two gradient back to x check and so x. And they satisfy some rules, which you could write out algebraically, but since we've already got monoidal string diagrams, we might as well express the axiom in terms of monoidal string diagrams. That's just this equals this and this equals this. Okay. So there's a sort of string straightening. And there's a further requirement we need for the category to be rigid that every object has to be the dual of something. So we need, we need to have some good rules. Okay, so now let's define rigid string diagrams, which are a slightly larger class than the normal string diagram. In a rigid string diagram, the strings are allowed to go up or down the page. Okay, they're allowed to have critical points, but the critical points can only ever be oriented to the right. Okay, and the fact that it's to the right rather than the left. This is just a reflection of the arbitrary choice we made here about which way our evaluation maps have to go. Okay. And now, isotopies of rigid string diagrams uh, are a slightly more general class of planar isotopies. Uh, you can cancel pairs of critical points now, cancel or introduce pairs of critical points, basically following, following sort of this rule, uh, but you're still not allowed to form any rotations on the objects. Okay. Now, given a monoidal string diagram, oh, sorry, given a rigid string diagram uh, with labels drawn from a rigid monoidal category, we can interpret that diagram as a morphism in the rigid monoidal category. And so I need to tell you how to interpret the new features I introduced. The new features we introduced were strings pointing downwards. So a string labeled by x pointing downwards 
we interpret as the identity morphism on X check, on the zero <coughs> of X, and we interpret the light moving critical points as the evaluation map of the total evaluation map. Okay? And so this is this is told you how to how to how to interpret or evaluate rigid free diagrams in a rigid manner. Okay. And we have exactly the same two two theorems, which I can say very briefly. If you've got two rigid swing diagrams which are isotopic, they automatically evaluate to the same morphism between the rigid category. And corresponding to those those two pages, uh, it was probably very confusing about uh, this alternative definition of swing diagram categories, you can you can easily prove that every real one you can prove uh, every rigid monodal category is equivalent to some category that consists of rigid swing diagrams, modulus and local. Okay, but this is all annoying and silly at this point. We're dealing with string diagrams with these artificial constraints about the, the, the strings going up the page or the critical points only going to the right. And so uh, finally, let's do the, the proper case. So anytime you have a, uh, a rigid category, you can assemble this association, x goes to x check. Well, actually, remember here that x goes to x check wasn't really actually a function. When we wrote down the axioms for a rigid category, we really asserted the existence for every x, some x check, satisfying some conditions. Okay, there might have been many different x checks that satisfy those conditions. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that if you're rigid, then using the axiom of choice or something, it is possible to pick a whole consistent family of choices, an x check for every x, so that it actually becomes a functor. Okay, and we define check. So check is a monoidal functor, but it doesn't go from C to itself. It goes from C to C off off. So off is probably no <coughs> Off is just the category where you reverse the direction of all the morphisms. And mop is the monoidal category where you reverse the definition of tensor flux. And so you define check on morphisms using the evaluation and co-evaluation maps. So the check is the morphism F from X and Y is this guy where, where we will take you know, Pulling the strings clockwise by 180 degrees using co evaluation and evaluation. Okay, uh, so we're asserting, and it's a good exercise, that if you're rigid, then you really can make the choice of such a functor. Uh, and then a pivotal structure uh, on, a, um, on a rigid monoidal category is a choice of monoidal natural isomorphism it can be identity to check to check. If you like worrying about these things, you could worry about. Whether check to check really makes sense, given that check starts and ends at different places, but it's not really at all. So what else is going on? Okay. So hopefully, hopefully that you saw last week. There we go. Okay. Okay. So finally, let's define pivotal string diagrams. But I'll put pivotal in parentheses because we're just going to leave it out now. These are the honest, proper, good string diagrams. Uh, so a pivotal string diagram has no constraints about the tangencies. So now we need to give a rule for interpreting critical points that point the wrong way, and we interpret critical points that move to the left using the pivotal isomorphism. Okay, so we need to produce a map that goes from x check tensor x to nothing, and what I do is I use the pivotal isomorphism, which is x is the x double check, using the pivotal isomorphism on the right, and then I use the evaluation map for x check, and that gets me to where I want to go. Okay, uh, so that we've now defined pivotal string diagrams, we define how to evaluate pivotal string diagrams, and then a pivotal isotopy of pivotal string diagrams is just an arbitrary isotopy in the plane. You can introduce and cancel critical points, you can rotate vertices completely freely. And again, we have the two, the two theorems that two isotopic, two, two pivotal isotopic pivotal string diagrams automatically have the same evaluation in any pivotal category, uh, and then uh, Every pivotal category is equivalent as a pivotal category to some category built out of pivotal string diagrams, modulus, and local order. And so this, this is sort of one of the things that justifies always using string diagrams if you want to. And, and it also explains why, um, I mean, it's, it's actually a little bit, a bit interesting here. Uh, when you build things up algebraically, monodal categories, rigid monodal categories, pivotal monodal categories, uh, Things are getting more and more complicated as you go up the hierarchy. 
Okay, you have all these conditions for rigidity, you have all this extra structure for pivotality. From the point of view of string diagrams, it's actually the opposite. Okay, the monoidal categories are the most complicated ones. There are string diagrams with these strange restrictions on tangencies, and pivotal string diagrams are the simplest ones. Just, just graphs drawn in the plane, modulo isotopy in the plane. And I mean, I really think that the pivotal things are the are more natural in that point of view. Okay, so there's another exercise here. These diagrams are, are obviously pivotally isomorphic. You just take the f and g's and rotate them each by 360 degrees and move things around a little bit. Uh, and uh, I can attempt to do this exercise. Maybe it's not what I really want anyone to do, but try and provide some estimate of the number of axioms uh, from, the, from the algebraic axioms you'd have to use to prove that fact and cry at how large the number is. <laughs> and, uh, and then and then stop using the axioms. Okay, so uh, where are we up to? Okay, we're up to nowhere close to where I thought we'd get up to, but my time is up. So the next thing we need to do next is to explain that planar algebras and pivotal categories are exactly the same thing, uh, just different axiom different different axiomatizations of the same real thing. Um, so let's uh, let's do that tomorrow, I guess. Thanks. Other questions or comments before we stop? I have a really stupid one. Yeah. What do you what do you really mean by tangency? Oh, um, I mean, well, I mean, this string diagram, conveniently, this blackboard has x and y coordinates. I mean, uh, these these were all diagrams that we were drawing in little rectangles in the plane. They had a, they had a lower bound and an upper bound. Okay, and so. Uh, I mean, I didn't, we didn't specify this, but, but I, maybe I should have said that all the strings with smoothly embedded arcs in the plane that met the boundary transversely and so on. Yeah. So obviously, I, pinning down exactly what I mean by string diagram, uh, you need to say some stuff about, about smoothness and transversality and things like that. Uh, but once you've said that, um, then you just take tangent vectors to strings and ask that they just have positive y coordinates. Let us think.